his work. Thanks. Uh, 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 thanks for coming. So I'm going, uh, going to talk about multilinear maps and attacks today. And what I'm going to talk about uh, is going to be based on three works. The first by myself, Gentry and Halevi from Eurogroup 13. Uh, then a, the, another multilinear map construction by uh, Coron, Lipoin, and uh, Tibuchi. And then a very recent uh, Eurocrypt uh, 15 paper, which is an attacks paper by Chion, Han, Li, uh, Ryu, and Stella. Okay. Not to put in the. Okay. So here's the outline. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about what bilinear maps are. I'm going to, uh, as I describe what bilinear maps are, I'll intuitively also sort of hint upon what multilinear maps are. I'll mention what the known results are, some of the applications. There are going to be uh, two talks after this, one on obfuscation and other applications of obfuscation. Both are going to talk about applications of multilinear maps, so I won't spend too much time on it. Next, I'll move on to uh, defining what multilinear maps are. I'll start with the classical notion of multilinear maps as has been envisioned in the literature. It sort of will build upon this intuitive uh, notion of multilinear maps that we will have in our minds. Then what we are able to realize is not this, uh, this, this uh, traditional notion of multilinear maps, but an approximate version of it. So I'll start with this classical notion and slowly transform it into something which is uh, the approximate version, and that is what we're going to realize. And then in, uh, I'll, I'll give the two uh, multilinear candidate constructions, the DGH scheme and the CLT scheme. And for each of them, I'll, I'll give you a sample of one of the attacks. I won't mention all of the, uh, I won't go into details of all of the attacks, but I'll mention what all exists at the end of the talk to give you a glimpse on what's happening and what is the status of each construction. OK, so let me start with uh, bilinear maps. And uh, uh, we'll intuitively, by the end of this part, uh, we'll also have an idea about what uh, multilinear maps are, and we'll have an idea of why they are important and what is roughly known. So bilinear maps are this extremely useful tool in cryptography. They have just a lot and lot of applications, starting with the first works by Jew and Bonnie and Franklin. So Jew gave the first uh, three-party non-interactive key exchange protocol using bilinear maps, and Bonnie and Franklin gave the first uh, identity-based encryption scheme. And as the name suggests, uh, cryptographic bilinear maps work over uh, these cryptography groups, which additionally have a structure called the, uh, called the bilinear map, which allows for pairing two things together. Okay? So more formally, uh, we have groups G1 and G2. Let's say both of prime order P with generators G1 and G2 respectively, such that they come equipped with this bilinear map E that takes as input two group elements, one from, uh, G, uh, both from G1 and outputs an element in G2. Okay? So, uh, and this map has this additional property that for every A comma B in ZP, if you were to pair G1 to the A with uh, G1 to the B, then you get G2 to the AB. Okay? So uh, typically, bilinear maps are defined by having a source group and a target group. Uh, I define it by having G1 and G2 because it's sort of more natural to extend it in the setting of multilinear maps. Also, if you were to put in A and B in this expression, you essentially get G2 as a pairing of E, G1, comma, G1. Okay? So in, in the setting uh, where, where, where you have uh, groups with this additional structure, the, the bilinear map, the decisional Diffie-Hellman pro problem turns out to be easy. So what is the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem or the DDS problem? The problem says that if I was to give you in a group G1 uh, to the A, where A is chosen uniformly at random, and similarly G1 to the B, where again B is chosen uniformly at random, and a challenge element T, where T is either G1 to the AB or G1 to the R, where R is chosen uniformly at random, then an attacker cannot tell which of the two values he's provided. Okay? But once you have access to, so this problem is known to be hard in, uh, uh, in, in just prime order groups. But if you were to, uh, if you were to uh, have these, by, uh, the, the, these special cryptographic groups where uh, such a map exists, then this problem turns out to be easy. So in particular, if you were to pair G1 to the A with G1 to the B, if T was indeed G1 to the AB, then these two pairings will uh, evaluate to the same value. So th this is going to be E G1 comma G1 to the power AB, and same as this value. So the DDS problem is easy. Well, we're in crypto. We're always in the business of making hard problems, assuming hard problems. Why am I talking about something which is easy? 
So even though this problem is, is easy, uh, the computational va variant of this problem, which is the CDH problem, which says that if I was to give g1 to the a and g1 to the b, it's still hard to get or compute g1 to the ab. So a polynomial time attacker will not be able to compute this value. Okay? It is this dis disparity between the easiness of the, the, the decisional problem and the computational problem that makes a lot of these applications work out. Uh, the, the specific cryptography groups over which uh, these, uh, these pairings exist are the, are the elliptic curve groups with uh, wheel or tate pairings over them. Additional cryptographic assumptions can be made over uh, such groups, and these additional assumptions enable even more applications. So one specific assumption that we're going to be very interested in is, the, is a natural generalization of the, the DDH assumption, specifically the bilinear Diffie-Hellman assumption. What this assumption says that if I was given uh, elements g1, g1 to the a, g1 to the b, and g1 to the c, where a, b, c are chosen uniformly at random, then it's hard to distinguish g2 to the a, b, c from random. Okay? So in the setting of uh, uh, bilinear maps, putting two things in the exponent or getting them to multiply in the exponent sort of comes easy because, uh, because the maps come equipped with this, additionally with this uh, uh, pairing operation. But if you were to put three things in the exponent, it suddenly becomes hard, in fact, even to just distinguish this value from random. Okay. And multilinear maps are sort of a very natural extension of this, where uh, in a k-linear map, you get to put k things in the exponent or get, get to multiply k things in the exponent for free. But the moment I have k plus, thing, k plus one uh, values in the exponent, distinguishing that value from random r r remains hard. So this notion uh, of, or, or this generalization of bilinear maps to the setting multilinear maps was first suggested by Boney and Silverberg, and, and sort of uh, they also showed various applications uh, that, that, that would happen if we had access to such a map, but sort of showed uh, uh, challenges that lie in, in constructing such maps uh, using techniques that were known uh, for, for, for the bilinear setting. Okay. So for the, can, uh, for the multilinear maps, what we do know now is, is there are three uh, uh, constructions of multilinear maps. They're all approximate. What does approximate mean will become clear as I define the notion. The, uh, uh, and and the, the first two sort of closer to the uh, envisioned world, and the third one is, uh, it's, uh, it's, even though it's GGH, it's a gentry gorbunov uh, halevi So the, the red one is me, the, the black one is not me. Um, so, a, a, the, the, this construction achieves multilinear maps, which are, uh, 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 which, which are still sufficient for many applications, such as obfuscation, but are not sufficient for all applications. And there are a sequence of attacks. We had some attacks in the original uh, GGH work, and there have been uh, uh, many new attacks uh, uh, that have come in the, in the, the past uh, few months, I would say. These attacks. Uh, work in various settings, and for, for when we talk about multilinear maps, it's not just one assumption. There are uh, plenty, in fact, an extremely large class of assumptions that you could potentially make on a map, and uh, these attacks work for certain specific settings. Uh, some attacks work for uh, more general settings, some attacks work for uh, uh, more limited settings, and sort of a, a very, uh, one has to think very carefully about what applications one is looking at. In particular, one point I want to stress is that uh, uh, no, none of these attacks uh, are, 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 are known to, uh, or yet known to work on any of the obfuscation or most of the obfuscation schemes that we know. Furthermore, you know, while obfuscation is cool, but multilinear maps seem to have a lot of other applications as well, and we would like to instantiate maps in a way uh, and, and recover those original applications. The new candidate uh, scheme by Coron et al., which sort of builds upon the, uh, the previous CLT maps from uh, crypto 2013, sort of provides a, a fix or a scheme that is resilient to uh, all or at least the known attacks uh, that we so far have. And it uh, remains a very active area of research. Uh, the, sort of the bottom line in my eyes is that very little in this area is known. Uh, we're just starting to scratch the surface. and. Both uh, 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 constructions as well as attacks are, are very much benefiting from, from the research in this direction. Okay, so as I said, I'll, I'll mention very briefly about uh, two applications, and uh, there will be a lot of talk on it, so just very briefly. The first application I'm going to talk about is for the setting of non-interactive key agreement, which is by 
which was first proposed by Diffie and Hellman for the two-party setting. So the problem is as follows. We have two parties, Ellis and Bob. They want to send one message to each other. So Alice gets to send a message PKA. Bob sends, gets to send PKB to Alice. And they are not dependent on each other. So they must send it simultaneously. And at the end of the, the, this protocol, or just a simple one round uh, exchange, they want to establish a shared key KAB, such, such that only Alice and Bob have access to this shared key. Okay? And they want the security guarantee that an attacker who gets to see this communication, in particular the keys PKA and PKB, should not be able to figure out anything about this uh, key that they were able to establish, the KAB. Uh, Ju was able to extend it to the three-party setting uh, using uh, uh, bilinear maps. And, and Bone and Silver were sort of uh, very naturally uh, noticed that if one had access to multilinear maps, one could very readily extend this uh, result to the multi-party setting. So let me very briefly describe what the protocol is in sort of uh, in the two-party setting, it naturally extends to the three-party setting and, and so on. So for, for the, well, I'll start by the two-party setting in which the DDH problem is hard. So we have Alice, what she does is she samples a random, uniformly random value A, generates G1 to the A and sends it to Bob. And similarly, Bob samples B, generates G1 to the B and sends it to Alice. At this point, both of them can compute the shared key G1 to the AB. So Alice has access to the secret information A. She can exponentiate what Bob just sent G1 to the B with A and gets G1 to the AB. And similarly, Bob having access to B could exponentiate G1 to the A and get the same value. And by the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem, this value is indistinguishable from random, so an attacker cannot figure out what this value is. This extends very naturally to the three-party setting once you have access to bilinear maps. And the protocol is, is, is again, a very natural generalization. Now that we have three parties, Alice, Bob, and Carol, they generate uh, ABC uniformly at random and broadcast G1 to the A, G1 to the B, and G1 to the C, respectively. And each of them can compute G, E, G1, comma, G1 to the uh, power ABC. So for example, Alice could, could generate this value by pairing together G1 to the B and G1 to the C, and then exponentiating the output with A, the secret information that she holds. Okay. This naturally extends to the three-party setting, and, uh, 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 and, and, that, and I'm not going to talk more about it. Okay. okay, so the next application, which I'm just going to mention, just have this one slide on, is software obfuscation. They're going to be, the next two talks are going to be on it. The goal of software obfuscation is to make computer programs unintelligible while preserving their functionality. So let's say Alice has some program P, say in her favorite programming language. She wants to give this program to Bob, but only in an obfuscated form. So Alice wants Bob to be able to execute this program on his computer, just as he could have executed the original program P. But she doesn't want Bob to learn how this program P works or what secrets are embedded inside it. Uh, it, it sort of very tricky to define what, I'm, what kind of secrets you're trying to hide inside software, uh, whether we can hide them, how are we going to hide them, and uh, what constructions are we going to build to hide them. And I'm not going to talk about any of that and leave that for the, the, the next uh, uh, talk. But I'm going to talk about, uh, well, not even the rest of the application. This is an outdated list from two years ago or one year ago. Um, in the, uh, 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 but, so the, the punchline is pick your favorite primitive in cryptography. It could potentially be improved uh, for now, not, not necessarily in terms of uh, uh, practical efficiency, at least theoretical efficiency sometimes, but in terms of many adding new features and so on. And it makes many, many, many uh, new applications which were previously thought of as, as impossible, uh, very much possible. And that's why sort of the, the stakes for, for having secure realizations for multilinear maps or enhancing our confidence about what exists are, are, are much higher. OK, so hopefully this gives you some idea about you know, what bilinear maps are, what it intuitively means to extend them to multilinear maps, why we should care about them, and uh, sort of roughly what sort of uh, is going on uh, in the world today. So let me now move on to definitions of multilinear maps. And as I said, I'll start with the classical notion and sort of slowly change it into what I call the approximate notion. And as, as I make these changes, sort of become clear uh, what are the sort of approximations we're making and what is the weakening in sort of the envision maps that, that we have. Okay. So uh, let me start with the, the classical uh, notion. So it's just a very natural extension of the, the bilinear maps definition 
instead of having just two groups B1 and B, G, sorry, G1 and G2, I'm going to have groups G1, G2 up to Gn. All of the same prime order P will generate as G1 to Gn respectively. And now instead of requiring just one map, which we took as input two elements in G1 and, and spit it out an element in G2, I'm going to require the existence of a family of maps. So EIK is a map that takes as input an element in the group GI and an, an, and an element in group GK and maps it to an element in group GI plus K. And the, these maps exist as long as I plus K is less than or equal to N. Okay? And they have the additional property that if you were to pair, this, uh, this is properties analogous to the pairing property from the bilinear world, that if you took any A and B and you were to pair GI to the A with GK to the B, then you get GI plus K to the power AB. So you can think of it as a layered structure. You have the, at the lowest level, the group G1 and G2 and so on, up at, and GN at the top. You can take two elements in any of the two groups at any of the two layers, pair them together, such that the levels at, the, the, the levels at which they are, the levels get added, and you get the, uh, the, the product of the values that, the, uh, that were encoded, in this particular case A and B, in the exponent. Okay? So in this setting, we hope that at least the discrete problem, uh, problem is in each of the GIs is hard. So in particular, uh, if I was given GI to the, the value A, discrete in, in, in just discrete log in, in, in an arbitrary group is defined if you have the generator G. If you have given G to the A, it should be hard to find A. We're going to similarly require that at least if I'm giving you GI to the A, it should be hard to find A. But hopefully if I'm giving you GI to the A, you should not even be able to compute GI minus 1 to the A. So you shouldn't be able to go down. So the only way is go going upwards in this, this hierarchy of levels, but there's no coming down. But to enable a lot, a lot of the applications, we're going to hope that generalizations of the bilinear Diffie-Hellman assumption that I just mentioned uh, also hold. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about what the assumption is later. OK, so let me start with the, uh, the sort of the approximate version that I want to get. And this is what I'm going to describe. I'm going to first start by giving a, a, our visualization of traditional bilinear maps. So why, I'm going, uh, uh, why am I talking about bilinear maps with our visualization is because I want to make some subtle points about bilinear maps very clear, which are not going to be easy to achieve in our setting. And, and, and I want to make those explicit so that we can talk about how they are actually achieved in our setting. I'm going to extend this traditional notion of bilinear maps uh, into our approximate notion of bilinear maps. And at each step, it's going to be sort of uh, almost trivial to imagine how that approximation is going to get uh, extended to the multilinear setting, and also keep mentioning that you can do that. Extension? Yes. So are there impossibility results for the traditional notion of multilinear maps? So there is. Uh, Bonnie and Silver were, uh, said that uh, you cannot get something from the abelian varieties. So that's what they do. Abelian varieties. So it's a kind of uh, elliptic curve groups or, or things similar to that. Um, uh, that you couldn't use those to build them. Okay, so again, they said that you cannot use uh, billion varieties in order to use. Yes, them. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I think so. They can't know how to do it, or What's, they, yeah. they give a, a impossibility. I think. Um, a, a, uh, I'm not completely familiar with the techniques from that paper, but uh, based on my recollection, it did say roughly that uh, it's not possible. The, I, I think, OK, so now that I'm remembering, it said um, it's implausible in some sense, uh, but not like, uh, yeah. Implausible doesn't mean an assumption. It is an assumption. Um, to make an assumption, you first have to have a candidate, right? We don't have a candidate. Right. And they're saying that it's unlikely to have a candidate. Um, so let me talk about bilinear maps. So uh, in bilinear maps, we had the plain text space, which is ZP, and consists of this elements 1 to P. And each of these elements, or, or these plain text elements, can be encoded. I'm going to call this as an encoding uh, of uh, each plain text element being encoded in the group G1. So in particular, if you took uh, uh, 1, it can be encoded as G1 to the 1, 2 is encoded as G1 to the 2, and so on. Okay, so G, recall that G1 was the generator of the group G1. And similarly, uh, for the group G2, I could encode these plain text values as G2 to the 1, G2 to the 2, and so on. So one thing that sort of uh, very, we take for granted in the setting of uh, bilinear maps, or sort of any uh, um, 
sort of even any any uh, even in prime order groups, is that it's uh, it's 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 uh, trivial to sample uniformly from ZP. So in our setting, I'm mentioning it explicitly because in our setting, it's not going to be very clear how what the sampling means and how it's being done. The next is uh, equality check. So in in the setting of bilinear maps or the envisioned wo world or the constructions from elliptic curves, each element, so each plain text value, and as well as an encoding of that plain text value in both G1 and G2 is represented by a unique representation. So if I have the encoding G1 to the 1, if I was to represent it in, 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 in some way on a piece of paper, then there's a unique bit string that identifies this encoding. Okay? Uh, this is also not going to be the case in our setting, so which is going to make equality check hard. Next is addition. Uh, if you wanted to add uh, two encoded terms in G1, you multiply the encoded values, and that gives you an encoding of the sum of the encoded values. Okay. Similarly, if you were to pair uh, two encodings, say in G1, then you get an encoding uh, in the uh, in, in uh, to pair two encodings in G1, then you get an encoding in in G2, which encodes the product of the encoded values. And similarly, for multilinear maps, you just have to have more uh, groups, and all these operations hold in the same way, as long as you l remain below the ceiling or the wall in this case. <laughs> so uh, the first approximation that I'm going to make in the setting of approximate uh, bilinear maps and their generalization to multilinear maps is that I'm no longer going to have each plain text value and each encoding be represented by a unique representation. Uh, but instead, I'm going to have a set of representation. So one is just one value, but it can be represented by an entire set of representation. So each, this, you can think of this set as a set of strings, and each string, which I'm calling a representation, denotes the same value. Okay? And similarly for each of the encodings. So this encoding, g1 to the 1, is going to be represented by a set of strings uh, and I'm going to call each element in the set a representation of this encoding, and so on, and for multilinear maps. Uh, uh, one thing to note is that the, the subscript here denotes the level of the encoding, the plain text and elements. I'm also going to call them level 0 encodings. And uh, if I had groups G1 and G2, the subscript here denotes level 1 encoding and level 2 encoding. And the, thing, the superscript denotes the plain text value that's being encoded. The union of all these sets together, which are, is, is, is the union of S01 and, and so on, is a set of all level 0 encodings, and, and so on. So this is a set of all level 1 encodings, set of all level 2 encodings, and so on. Okay? So what I've defined so far is I have a finite ring R, and sets SI, so that for every I in N, that is the level, uh, level I encodings, SI is the set of level I encodings, and each set SI can be partitioned into SIA for each A in R. So these are all level 0 encodings that can be partitioned into these uh, sets, which are the representations of the corresponding plain text elements. Okay. So, Jim, yes? Sorry, it's probably the same question. But the reason you're doing this is because for multilinear maps, that's what we managed to achieve. That's yes. What inherently we want. So uh, uh, what they said was if you had a completely, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the kind of structures we had available there, they were sort of, uh, I don't know exactly, but roughly, uh, uh, we're, we're incapable of extending them in, in some ways. Uh, and this is something that we build on top of lattices, and this is what we are able to achieve. And so, yes. Um, okay. Sanjam, you said it's a ring. So far, you only talk about groups. So, is so this is the ring of the plain text element. So, right, in, in the, the, I was talking about the groups, but the plain text elements were in ZP, which was, right? All these sets have the same cardinality, and they're the obvious mappings. So for now, you can assume that's the case. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to keep on approximating them, and then it's going to become slightly different, but let's assume that. Um, uh, OK, so each SI can be partitioned into SIA for each A, uh, uh, where SIA is the level I encodings of A. The, the, the next uh, property, which I said was sort of uh, uh, trivial for for the ZP was to that you could sample um, uniformly from ZP. So now it's now very clear what I'm going to, if I want to sample a, a random plain text element, what does it actually mean? Because for each plain text element, I have a, represent, a set of representations. 
And what I, the property I'm going to require is I'm going to require the existence of an efficient procedure that samples from this set S0. So if you sample from S0, you're going to get an, a value alpha. I'm going to require that the, uh, this, when you sample alpha, it's going to come from one of these sets, since they define a partition on this. I'm going to require that the induced distribution on A, so if alpha comes from S0A, that the induced distribution on A be uniform. So note that I'm not requiring that I sample uniformly in S0. I'm not required, if I sample from S0, it's going to come from one of the sets. I'm not requiring that be uniform from uh, the set it comes from, but just that the set it comes from, I'm requiring uniformity over that. Okay? So I'm going to require the existence of a, yeah? Uh, the ability to sample from each S0A, given A... Uh... So, uh, in the construction, we will not have the ability to do that. And uh, for applications, it seems that it's, it's uh, for a lot of the applications, it's not necessary. Okay. So, sampling uh, output alpha says that alpha is an S0A for a uniform A. Okay, so the next is equality check. Uh, in the setting of bilinear maps, it was trivial in the setting of uh, uh, this approximate by linear maps, what I'm going to require is that if I was to give you two representations from any of the sets, then you should be able to efficiently tell me that they come from the same set. Okay. So equality test says that if I give you two uh, encodings, alpha and beta, both at level i, then this procedure outputs one if and only if there exists a such that alpha, beta come from the same SI. Yes. Sampling also means that you can sample from more than level zero, or is the sampling is only for level. So sampling, as defined here, just for level zero, right? So uh, yeah. Addition, just like in the the bilinear setting, you could multiply two encodings, and that gave you an encoding of the sum of the encoded values. We would require the existence of some conditional canon, canonical addition operator that allows you to take rep or any two representations and add them to obtain a representation in the uh, set of representation that corresponds to the sum of the uh, original encoded values. Um, so for example, if you were to take a, a representation from S11 and, and a representation from S12, then, and, and if you were to add them using that, uh, that operator, then you will get S13, and a, a representation from S13, yes. Now everything is, uh, you can think of it as encryption. So. Yes. Yes. I, I, in fact, I haven't even placed any security requirement. You could just think of them in the clear. Saying, yeah. I mean, the mechanics are uh, yeah. similar. Yes. 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 Linearly yes. 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 Except for the equality, which that breaks the, the analogy, right? Uh, well, I mean, the equality did exist in the bilinear setting as well. Right, right. But if it was an encryption. Oh, in that sense, yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, so just uh, as Hugo said, we could have, uh, since we have addition, we could also have subtraction in an analogous way. And we could add at any level if you had multilinear. And similarly, I could also define multiplication. So uh, in, the, uh, in the pairing world, we had the, well, in the bilinear pairing world, we had this uh, pairing operation that you could get to G2. Now I need to have a way of multiplying representations to, to go to the next level and be able to, um, yeah. yes. Requirement about uniformity, like when you do addition or multiplication, you have to be uniform in that set, so that when you no. see it, you don't know where it came from. So I haven't placed any secu security requirements so far, right? So if you were to just have unique representation, the things that I've said so far, it already satisfies that, right? So right, but a unique representation doesn't give you information how I got it, whereas oh, if you have a set, yes. So so far, I haven't placed any requirement. The requirement on any kind of uniformity that we, we are ever going to place is going to come from security properties. We're going to require that security holds, and whatever that, you know, to achieve that security, whatever best we can do to achieve whatever uniformity is needed, we're going to do that. But, uh, yes. Okay, so uh, multiplication can be naturally defined where you have. Uh, um, uh, but one thing to answer Hugo's question, there's a difference, is that you do keep track of what level you are at. So you want to be, when you multiply things, you, it's different from homomorphic, multiplica homomorphic multiplication in the sense that uh, you want to keep track of what level you are in. You don't want to go beyond the nth level. Right? Okay, so the final approximation which you're going to make, and which is sort of the trickiest one in uh, um, and that's why I have it at the end, is that 
within these sets, I'm going to have a subset of uh, representations denoted by this black spot. And everything that I just described so far, addition, multiplication, equality check, they are all required to work only as long as you remain within this black spot. Okay? So the moment you step outside this black region within each of the sets, all bets are off. There's no guarantee about correctness. Nothing is required anymore. And this is sort of to give you an intuition similar to the fully homomorphic encryption requirement where you can keep doing computation, but the moment the noise becomes too large, no more computation can be done and the sort of the result is completely meaningless. Okay. Sanjo, you yes. Have a yes. No, uh, to the requirement, yes. So, uh, uh, you know, I go, uh, if I am given some encoding, do I know, can I officially test which level it is from? So how that is done is by including the level of the encoding along with the encoding. Oh, okay. You just right. So you, whenever you have an encoding, you additionally include with it what level it is, what noise it is, and any time it's going to be, uh, uh, this information is passed on. And you're assuming that that's being done sort of semi-honestly. If there is a malicious setting, then it's sort of tricky and you have to take care of it separately. Okay, so as I said, in this setting, we're going to hope at least the discrete log problem is hard. So given uh, an encoding of A at level J, it should be hard to compute an encoding of A at level J minus 1. And additionally, we're going to require sort of a, a plethora of other assumptions. The specific one that I'm going to talk about mostly in this talk is the N multilinear Diffie-Hellman assumption, which says that if I give you level 1 encodings of 1, A1, up to AN plus 1, and a level encoding uh, T, which is either an encoding of the product of a1 to an plus 1, or just a random value, then uh, an inefficient attacker cannot tell those two apart. Okay. So just uh, going back, sorry, to this, uh, the previous uh, oh. slide before. Um, yes. So here you're saying in each set there is a black subset? Yes. The reference is only required on the black set? Yes. Yes. It doesn't stay in the black set, okay. So then I'm not, all bets are off. But in particular, is it required that the initial set print falls into the black set? So uh, to, for it, the scheme to be meaningful, you're going to require that. Otherwise, if you sample outside the black set, then you can't do anything more with it, right? So in particular, so you're saying the yes. set procedure that samples the uniform element always lands in the black unit? Yes, black yes. Set. We're going to require that. I'm going to give a construction which achieves that. Okay. So, so but then you could have just started by defining the black set. Now, what's the point? You, I could have. Uh, I just did it because it's simpler to do it. I can just talk about all the things, the properties I want, and then I can say um, that there's a uh, black set inside it. And Sometimes you may go out. So. You, you may go out, yeah. yeah. Continuing this question, so how do you really uh, uh, define formally this, this noisy thing? I mean, I, I, I see that at the intuitive level, but it seems to me that you have some notion of, of uh, the blow up of a computation and the. Uh, yeah. Under this, this norm, uh, yes. So, so for each. What would be the definition? Like these black sets, I don't, I don't. You really use the black sets to define this thing, no? No, I mean it's it's a noise bound on the elements. So for each set, I would just say, take some. Uh, they are being represented by polynomials or or something or, or integers. I'm going to say if that the number is small, then it is in the black set. If it is larger than this value, it's not in the black set. But what do you mean by small? I mean uh, we want. Well, some, some uh, group or, or ring you said so. So, uh, so, so if you're a, of a ring, I'll define some norm over it, and then I'll say, as per that norm, as long as you're less than that bound, I'm good. Okay? So, so you're required that you can be able to check if you're in the, in the noise level you want. So as I said, what I'm going to require is that every time I give an encoding, I also specify the noise bound with it. You, and the noise bound is exactly the value that's in there, uh, and so on. Really, you need kind of sequence of these black sets, growing black sets, right? Because once you add two guys in the black set, you yeah. become a little bit. It, it will. So you would like to be able to keep adding. Yes. Multiplying. So, so that's why I said these, there are these black sets. What I'm going to give you is something that's going to be very, very tiny in the beginning, and it's going to become bigger. But the definition still holds for the whole set, right? If you were just allowed to do one computation and go here, the noise growth will. Uh, the moment. The definition just requires that if the noise grows beyond this, then you're, it becomes useless, right? right. So, so in other words, for, you, for things to become useful for the entire multilinear map, yes. in, in S0, the noise is tiny, and S1, it's a little bigger. Or yes, little yes, yes. Does, does that answer? It's, it's, I guess maybe the question is, it's not really 
It doesn't seem like you can guarantee the existence of sets <coughs> such that if you keep adding within these sets, you yeah. stay within the set. Oh, I didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I just said that one, if you're in the set, I can just give the guarantee that you will land in the correct. Uh, oh, yeah. OK. So you might go outside. But yes, so yes, 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 yes. OK. OK, so now that uh, we have some idea about the definition, let me move on to the two construction that I'm interested in talking about, the GGH construction and the CLT construction. I'll start with the, the GGH construction. Um, so so the, the, the construction is sort of roughly follows the entry-based uh, FHE scheme, additionally with this equality test parameter. So if you were to think about any fully homomorphic encryption scheme, it allows you to do some computation. Uh, uh, additionally, that you need uh, something that you need to keep track of is how many multiplications that have been done so far. So that represents the level uh, of multiplications that have happened so far. And the, at the end, you want the capability to do an equality check. We'll also see that it suffices to do an equality check at the end. If you want to do an equality check at, the, at, at one of the earlier levels, you can always bring it to the, the top level and do the equality check. It will sort of become clear. So let me start with some background. I'm going to work uh, uh, over the ring R of, of po the polynomial ring Zx uh, by fx, where fx is, is uh, you, you can have various choices, but sort of the most uh, natural choice is x to the n plus 1, where n is a power of 2. Uh, a property of uh, this polynomial to keep in mind is that the x to the n plus 1 is irreducible over z. And another one is that if you were to take two, any two elements in this ring, and you were to multiply them and, and, and take the uh, uh, take, take the L2 norm, let's say if you were to take a, a polynomial here and see the, uh, the, co the, the, the vector representation of the coefficients, and you can define the L2 norm based on that, then if you were to take the two elements, multiply them in the ring, and take the norm of the two, this does not grow uh, very fast. Uh, does, this grows only by a polynomial, polynomial n factor compared to the, the norms of the, the initial uh, elements that you started with. So I have this ring R, and I'm also going to define the ring RQ, which is R by QR. Okay, so in addition to being a ring of polynomials over uh, 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 mod f xn to the xn plus one, I'm additionally going to have the requirement that coefficients come from ZQ instead from the inte uh, integer space. I'm now going to tell you directly how the scheme works and how what the public parameters for the scheme are. But first, I want to set the stage for what the actual encodings are going to look like. And I'm going to start by describing what they look like, and then we will see how they are going to actually be generated in the scheme. Okay? So there will be a, a, a procedure. Will, there will be some public parameters. You'll use them to actually generate the encodings that are needed in the scheme. But first, I'm going to just say how they look like. And the public parameters of the scheme are going to sort of hide two crucial secret elements. One is going to be a small element g in Rn. So note that since g is small, uh, the representation, is, uh, and, and q is, is, a very, is, is, is very large. Think of it as the largest quantity in the system. Since g is, is I'm, I'm sampling this g to be small, uh, the, the representation in, in R and Rq is going to be the same. Okay? And when I say small, it is polynomial in n. I'm also going to sample a random invertible large z in RQ. And this, the public parameters are also going to hide this value. So here, uh, small, so the degree is full, uh, like n, or n minus 1, I guess, but uh, the kind Yes, the, the co coefficients are small. Okay? So in particular, the, if you were to look at the, the vector formed by the coefficients, then the norm of that is small. And Q versus n, so Q is exponential in n, or...? Uh, so... To, that's for the lattice attacks. So in order to prevent that, you need the Q to be uh, exponential in N. The exact parameters, I think there is uh, some uh, just very recent result. I just looked at it. It needs to grow, I think, maybe N squared or N cubed or something like that. But some. Uh... Okay. Any other question? What do you mean? The, the, you mean the restrictions? Two to the N. Two to the N to the epsilon, right? Yeah. Which security? G being small? So the smallness requirement on G is required for functionality itself. Uh, uh, Z being, you know, the, the, uh, Z is sort of going to be a masking factor, and the best bet is to choose it completely at random. And uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's a, uh, if you were to look at the attacks, 
choosing a, a small z could perhaps also be OK. We don't know if an attack uh, or, or, or in that setting. But being as conservative as we can, we just take the largest z. So it would be interesting to see if small z's are somehow vulnerable to attacks. A, I, let i be the ideal generated by g. Uh, so I have i. And i also has a lattice structure. So um, there are going to be some additional requirements of, on g that I'm going to require. The first is, well, it's small. I'm also going to require that it be invertible in RQ. Uh, 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 I'm going to require that R, uh, the, 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 the norm be a large prime. And furthermore, there's a sort of a technical condition which, where I require that G inverse is, is small in K. Okay? So uh, where K is the same ring, uh, but instead now you have, uh, you t instead of the coefficients coming from, from, from Z, they're coming, they're, they're over rational numbers. Okay? So doesn't, we've been missing something, but uh, if G is invertible, right, uh, the ideal. So G inverse is in, in K. Uh, but the first bullet, uh, right, I mean, G is invertible uh, in RQ. Right? Yes. Uh, that means that the ideal generated by G is the whole ring, right? Uh, in R, R, it's not. The, the first uh, bullet, uh, right, this is small and invertible in RQ. It's invertible in RQ. RQ. Right, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so with, with high probability, a random element is, is invertible. Okay. A large enough random. OK, so in my uh, scheme, the, 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 the quotient group is going to correspond to the scalars of the plain text space. So for ZP is going to correspond to the, cos, uh, the, the cosets of I. OK, so so far in the construction, I have this ring R and RQ, and I've defined a small g that defines a principal ideal I over R. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the cosets, 1 plus I, 2 plus I, and so on, are going to, to uh, so each element in this coset describes a representation of an element in this set. So for the plain text element 1, it can be represented by any element in this coset. G and R, right? Uh, yeah, G and R. But it, it's, it's both, uh, as I mentioned, it's same in R and RQ because G is small. Okay? So I'll, I'll use interchangeably it being in, in R and RQ. It's sampled uh, so because it's the same unique representation. represents two, like you can imagine as two elements, one in R and RQ, but they're represented by the same string. Okay. It's easy to define additional multiplication operations over uh, these. So in particular, if you were to take any two elements uh, from any of the cosets, and if you were to add them up, then you get an element in the addition coset and so on. Recall that I also define this large z, which I also require to be invertible in RQ. In order to encode, for example, 2, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample a small element in this coset 2 plus i. Again, by small, I mean uh, a, a polynomial within this coset with small coefficients. Sorry, sorry. Yes? So is g, g is hidden? G is going to be hidden. Z is also going to be hidden. OK, so, so just look, focusing for a second just on the first uh, level encoding on s yes. So you're saying by the fact that G is hidden, that's already enough to say that you cannot distinguish between two encodings. That's kind of your initial. Uh, uh, if you're given, um, and, uh, you know, in two, yeah. Well, if you didn't have two, it's it just looks like a random element. Uh, well, uh, for the small encoding, sort of becomes things become. For example, zero is always going to be in the coset uh, I, right? In in the ideal itself, zero, the trivial zero is there. So for that, you can tell. But in general, you will not be able to tell. So you're saying the discrete log in the original thing, if you don't know anything, you're given some kind of polynomial. And the question is, what small constant do you subtract that it has like a small divisor? You're saying that if you don't know the divisor, that's hard to tell. Uh, if you don't know g, yes. It's hard to tell, yeah. Not really. I mean, if you gain an enough encodings of zero, this is a linear space. You would recognize that it's a linear right. space. And then you know. Oh, if you give enough encodings of zero along with. No, but if you give enough encodings of zero, right? That's giving the ideal. Zero, you don't really require any security. Assuming that level zero and plain text are, you know, morally equivalent. But giving uh, uh, elements from the level zero encoding is like giving G, like small elements there. So, right? It's like I'm, not, I'm trying to hide that. I see. So you're never going to give level zero encodings. Uh, uh, you can give of random elements, not of zero. Giving, right? Yeah. So giving zero is like giving G. Exactly. Right. 
Uh, and so the encoding proceeds by, I take a small element in this coset, I divide it by z, and this operation is done in RQ. And sort of this, as I said, is going to be this masking factor, which is sort of hiding uh, what's encoded here. If you want to do it, uh, the encodings at higher level just keep dividing by z. So if you had uh, uh, just divide by z again in RQ, and you get an, a level two encoding, and if you want to encode at higher levels, you could keep dividing, and then you get them. Okay. And uh, if you wanted to add encodings, if you took an en uh, an encoding. Uh, say of course at s a small element c in s plus i and a, a small element d in the course of t plus i, the encodings would look like c by z and d by z. And if you were to add them in RQ, what you're going to get is an encoding c plus d by z, uh, where the operations are performed in RQ, with the with the guarantee that if c and d were short to begin with, then c plus d is still going to be short. So the encoding looks like an, a small element from the course at s plus t plus i divide by z. So it looks like a, 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 um, a legitimate encoding of s plus t. So, sorry, is z public? No. So you can't do this. You can't. So you can't. I, as I said, we're go I'm, I'm describing the things as they look like. I'm going to tell you how they're done uh, as we go further. Okay. Multiplication is a procedure analogously if you multiply two encodings. Uh, and it, it, the, the two encodings consist of c by z and d by z, where c is small and d is small. Uh, then, uh, uh, if both of them are small, then the product is going to remain is, is going to be small and is going to be from the product coset. Uh, so this encoding looks like uh, an encoding of s times t at the second level because the 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 exponents of these z's get added up. Right? So this is how, if you were to multiply encodings at level i and j, you will get an encoding at level i plus j. Okay, so in general, uh, a level k encoding, of course, at s plus, fi s plus i has the form c by z k for a short c in uh, s plus i. And if you wanted to add encodings all at the jth level, then you just simply add them up, and you get as long as the the numerator in all of them remains the sum of the numerators remains much smaller than q. And uh, uh, if you wanted to multiply, uh, uh, the multilinearity sort of proceeds by multiplying encodings. And as you do that, the, the, the levels that the at which the encodings are get added up. So in particular, the, the product encoding, uh, if the original encodings were at level ji, then you get the, the final encoding at level summation of i j i. So so far, what I've described to you is something very simpler, uh, simple, which corresponds to the somewhat homomorphic encoding speed, uh, where in addition to some somewhat homomorphic encryption, you are additionally remembering how much computation has, has happened so far. Okay? <clears throat> Sorry, what happens when the sum of the coefficients goes over q? Uh, then roll. Uh, the between... Well, you lose, uh, it sort of becomes junk, right? Because then there's going to be a wraparound on the numerator, and then you have some element, but this element sort of is um, interpreted in the, in the, the ring R, not in, in, in RQ. So lose the information about which, which place it was. Right. So what I've so far not described is how sampling inequality check works. So let me to get to that. Okay. So sampling, recall what I, uh, uh, the definition required uh, that I be, when I sample from S0, the requirement is uh, that it will come from one of these sets. The set it should come from be uniform. In particular, the induced, if it comes from S0A, then the induced distribution on A should be uniform. And the idea to do that is actually very simple. Just sample a small enough random element in RQ, and that, that already suffices. Okay? So when I say small enough, we have to choose the parameters carefully in the sense that they have to be larger than the coefficients of G, but much smaller than Q. Okay? And how this follows sort of follows in a way similar to uh, the smoothing parameter that, that Vinod talked about yesterday. Uh, 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 recall that uh, the, the ideal I has a lattice structure, so if you were to look at the fundamental parallelopiped of, of uh, defined by the lattice corresponding to I, then it tessellates the entire space. And if you were to sample uh, from a Gaussian distribution, which is wide enough, in particular, much larger or, or larger than the smoothing parameter, uh, then uh, uh, what you're going to get is you're going to get an element that co comes from one of the cosets, uh, uh, and the coset it comes from is going to be uniform. Okay, so so far I described what encodings look like and how you could sample a level zero encoding. So this is why you can only sample a random. Uh, yes, 
yes, yes, yes, yes, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so far I described how you can have a, 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 a uh, how you can sample a level zero random encoding and, yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Go back, sorry. Uh, go back to backtrack point sampling. So, no, uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you, when you sample, you sample for a random, uh, let's say I want to sample for a random S, a random process or random S in ZQ. Yes. S is large, it's size uh, essentially Q, right? So how, how, how can, how do you sample C that's short? So, uh, for each, you, you might have the S being large, but the corresponding representations in, in the, the ideal are small. So S is just a, it's, a, when you're looking at S, it is S plus some multiple of G. Right. So you, you have to find the right multiple such that the whole thing is small. Right. So if you sample a small element, it is going to be one such random S so with the additional property that this thing is small. Okay? So there's always something in the set. Yes, that makes it because the ideal itself is, if you, it's defined by G and itself is small, right? We're sampling from a space which is bigger than this idea. Yes? So, so let us try to add the two things from different levels. Okay. Yes. So, so add, let's say. So it seems that I get some nice polynomial in, in the, or, uh, you know, uh, the question of, of polynomials uh, uh, with nice structure in the uh, denominator. Like, like, it, it won't be the, like Z will not have the same degree, but it will have. Uh, so I don't know, this, 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 the fact that this is meaningful, doesn't it uh, going to, to, to be problematic? Uh, so, uh, so for example, uh, when you're adding something at, let's say, uh, one level one encoding and a one level two encoding, right? So you have one z in the denominator for one and z squared in the other. The numerators get multiplied as well. So, I mean, I don't see the nice structure. I don't know if this is a, you know, th th there's an avenue for attacks there, but I don't necessarily see a nice structure right away. Several additions for several levels, uh, and then similarly, you know, so. No, but they're, they're going to be z's in the numerators as well, right? When you do the. Okay. Right? Okay. So it's not only the It's not. But when you do the addition at different levels, right? Right. And I'm assuming you're doing operations in RQ. Yes. Right. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you how encodings are actually going to look like. So I'm going to publish in the public parameters an encoding of one. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to generate A small in the coset 1 plus i, divide by z in rq, and publish this value. So this is the first value that I've, I've, I've published so far, along with the parameters that are needed for the scheme to work. It's easy to sample, as I just described, uh, sample c from a wide enough uh, Gaussian, and you get c that comes from a random coset. I don't know which specific uh, element, plain text element, and encodes with in, encodes uh, a random one of them. Now, given this short c, what I can multiply it, I can, I can multiply with the level one encoding, and I get uh, an encoding uh, 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 of this random coset that I just picked. Okay? Okay. If you want to go further, you want to upgrade to level i plus one, you just keep multiplying with y. So you can go from a level i encoding to i plus one encoding by multiplying it with y. So this is the first public parameter that I've published so far. So next, I'm going to talk about the equality test. So note that the, uh, given this encoding of one, it suffices to do the equality test just at the, the final level. Because you can always start at the lower level, multiply it with encodings of one, reach the final level, and you're sort of done. Right? So I'm going to just describe equality test at the, the final level. Now, in order to do equality tests, if I'm given two encodings, u and u prime, and I want to check if they encode the same value, it suffices to check that the subtraction of the two encodes is zero. Right. I can just subtract them and check if it's zero. So I'm only going to describe what, uh, what it means to uh, check if an encoding encodes zero at the highest level. And in order to enable that, we're going to publish this, uh, uh, this additional parameter, the second one that I'm mentioning so far. Uh, which we call the zero testing parameter, which looks something like H Z K by G. Uh, again, the operations are done in RQ. And H here, so Z and G are the same as before. H here is going to be somewhat short. In particular, the, the, the coefficients are going to be of the size order root Q. In order to test if U is an indeed an encoding of zero, I compute the value W. 
So if uh, use an encoding of zero, then C comes from the ideal. And I'll multiply u with the, uh, with, with the zero testing parameter, I get z by zk times h zk by g. And what I'm left with is ch by z. Okay? And uh, I output yes if, uh, uh, if it's smaller than q part 3 by 4, let's say, and uh, no otherwise. So in, in particular, I would say, yes, this is an encoding of zero if this value is small, and uh, no otherwise. So correctness, while c is in the ideal, or c is a multiple of g, so d should cancel out, and uh, what we are left with something small. Okay? So th this is uh, uh, this is not uh, exactly true because the problem is that c prime itself may not be small. So c is a multiple of g, but c prime itself may not be small. Uh, but it can be argued. Let me do that. So the the the, the solution is that since I uh, I had a technical condition to begin with, I was requiring that the g inverse is, is small itself. So note that the computation. C times, uh, uh, C times G inverse, which is exactly this computation here on RQ, uh, uh, when C, C, C is C prime G times G inverse in K is the same value as in R, because we know that this value is in, in R. Right? So s since uh, we have that C is small and G inverse is small, therefore this whole product should also be small. If C is not in I, uh, then assume uh, the case that the w is less than q by 2. So in particular, uh, uh, I'm saying it's, it's less than q by 2. Then we have that both w, g, so you can take the g on the other side, g is small. Uh, so both w, g, and ch are less than q by 2. Okay? So note that uh, c is supposed to be small by the definition of any encoding, since uh, u was a valid encoding, c is required to be small h was sampled to be smaller than or of size square root q. Therefore, the, the, the product ch is going to be less than q by 2. And g is small, and w is small based on the computation itself. So both of them are small. And w, since both of them are small, therefore, we have that wg is equal to ch in r. So they're equal in rq. But since they're both small, then they must also be the same in r. But this implies that uh, by unique factorization that either g divides c or h. But h was chosen randomly. It's very unlikely to be in the ideal. So we have that uh, 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 g divides c. Okay. Any questions? So I think uh, this would be a good point for me to take the top. Yeah. But I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I mean, I don't know if that depends on what guy decides. <laughs> OK. What was the argument that you can choose g and g inverse to be small? So, uh, it, so if g is a polynomial, right, with small coefficients, if if you were to look at, uh, you can look at the canonical representations of these elements. So what that uh, means is evaluating this polynomial at the the roots of the polynomial x to the n plus one, which are the primitive roots of the two nth. Uh, uh, two nth primitive roots of unity. If you were to evaluate it, you will get uh, the canonical representation, and the transformation from this uh, from a, from the coefficient representation to the canonical one is just a scaling and rotation. So it's also uh, it's, if you start with a small element, it's going to be a small element up to a scaling factor. Since th those uh, uh, since those uh, um, the elements in that canonical representation are small, if you take the inverses for them. So taking inverse in the canonical representation is easy because uh, the values are just uh, inverses. Uh, so you can take that, and they're going to be small with uh, high likelihood, and then you can sort of, yeah. Is there a simpler argument? Well, no, but at least morally there is. I mean, think in one dimension. In one dimension, yeah. g is an integer, yeah. and g inverse is 1 over that integer. Yeah. It's smaller than yeah. 1, definitely small enough. In higher dimension, it doesn't grow too much. It's yeah. too much worse than that. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, so if you're saying, uh, yeah. Inverse being of size one would be plenty small enough for what we yeah. need. Yeah. And the argument there that said that if you choose things at random, it's not going to be a whole lot bigger than that. Yeah. But we do have a, a, a factor of which grows with the dimension that comes along. But yeah. Okay. So why would the why would the uh, the uh, ideal rings? No? Yeah. Um, the next construction I'm going to talk about is over the integer, so there's no specific reason, and there's in fact the more re like we should find more candidates and uh, more ways of doing it, right? So. so it's a good time to take a break, and let's resume at 11.